I had no idea where this case would lead. This case will turn the district attorney's office upside down. I never worked a case where I put so much heart and time into bringing a man home because of an injustice. I'm Jay Southpeter, I'm Marty Tankliff's private investigator. My name is Marty Tankliff. It was my first day of school, so I expected to wake up in the morning and go to school and start my senior year. When he woke up, instead of going to school, he found his father on the doorstep of death and his mother murdered. They were bludgeoned and stabbed. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, I thought I was in a nightmare. I saw him sitting in his office chair, and he was covered in blood. I knew he was alive because he was making breathing noises. I called 911 from the phone right there. And he, and he was a All right, hold on, and I'll connect you. I'm connecting you with the ambulance. Marty was a suspect because Marty was the only survivor in the house. And that's why the detective went right for Marty. Marty Tankliff was 17 years old at the time that he was arrested for murdering his parents in their home in Belltail, Long Island. How do you find, as the defendant, Martin Tankliff, as to count two, murder, second degree, guilty? There's no way I could have hurt my parents. I love them. I knew immediately he couldn't do it. The victim's family are Marty's family and they feel that Marty did not commit this crime. Marty was railroaded. He loved his mom, he loved his dad. I'm here because I believe Marty is innocent. All right. James Gambofini became interested in Marty's case. He saw a man that was in jail that shouldn't be in jail. Some of my witnesses. This was more than just a job. This became an obsession to me. When you see a case like this and you know something's wrong, you have to have an obligation in life. At the end of the day, the people responsible for killing Seymour and Arlene Tankler, they will go to jail. Marty is innocent. Marty's coming home. Fight for the truth. imagine that I would end up being in this place because I, I'm innocent. Marty Tankliff had just turned 17 when he was arrested for the murder of his parents, Seymour and Arlene. What's it like here? Difficult, but I keep myself as busy as possible. I spend hours working on my case every day. It's a struggle. He has spent his entire adult life in remote upstate New York prisons. It's a far cry from Marty Tankliff's childhood spent in the lap of luxury in this sprawling Long Island waterfront home. It was a wonderful childhood. I had more than the average kid. Seymour and Arlene Tankliff were unable to have children of their own, so they adopted Marty as a baby. He was just beautiful, and Arlene was just so thrilled how she wanted that baby. What was your mom like? Great. She adored me, and I adored her. We were like best of friends. He was also close to his father. My father lived a very poor childhood. And when I became a teenager, he had money. So he was living his childhood through me vicariously. Would you describe yourself as, as spoiled? Yes. You know, I got basically everything I ever wanted. Seymour, a savvy and tough entrepreneur, was grooming Marty to follow in his footsteps. I wanted to be a businessman, so I enjoyed being involved in all of that. Marty says he knew everything about his father's businesses, including the trouble his dad was having with a partner in a bagel shop, Jerry Stewerman, who owed him around half a million dollars. The friendship had dissipated. They essentially became enemy business partners. Despite the tension between Seymour Tankliff and Jerry Stewerman, 
both men continued to play in a weekly poker game. And on September 6, 1988, it was Marty's father's turn to be host. The game lasted into the wee hours, with Stewerman last to leave. The next morning, Marty says, he woke to find his father near death. He called 911. Just remember the woman screaming and yelling. Listen to me. Saying, calm down, calm down. I'm sending you an ambulance. She gave me some instructions. I want you to take a clean towel, wrap wherever he's gushing blood from. And did you do yeah, that? Yeah, I did that. Then, he says, he searched for his mother. He found her, dead on her bedroom floor. How would you describe the scene when you got there? It was, it was brutal. It was very brutal. James McCready, the lead detective, now retired, arrived an hour later. Seymour Tankliff, bludgeoned and stabbed, but still alive, had been rushed to the hospital. Arlene's body still lay in her room. It was an eerie feeling because it, it always is an eerie feeling. She was nearly decapitated, and it appeared to me that she had struggled with whoever assaulted her. McCready, a homicide cop for 10 years, saw no sign of forced entry, and he was immediately bothered by Marty's appearance. He was sitting as calm as calm can be, with his hands clasped just like this. What would you have expected him to be doing? I think he would have been crying. I think he would have been shaken, been very upset. What impression did you get from the way he was talking to you? that he was trying to help me and he wanted my help. As the conversation developed, I could see that uh, he was just, he's he was lying. I mean, and how did you know that? It's not so much the way, what is said, it's the way in which it's said. Marty volunteered his suspicions that Jerry Stewerman, his father's partner, was somehow involved. I knew that he was there. I knew he had problems with my father. And Marty agreed to talk more about that at police headquarters. But in fact, McCready thought he already had his man. Why would Marty kill his parents? Why? One of the simplest old things in the world, greed. 17-year-old Marty sat with McCready and his partner without a lawyer in a small windowless room. For hours, the detectives questioned him. It was the constant barrage. Marty, we know you did it. Everything will be okay. Just tell us you did it. We know you did it. And it was the on and on and on questioning over and over. Then McCready did something that would change everything. He left the room, pretended to talk on the phone, and came back with news about Seymour Tankleff. Your father, they pumped him full of adrenaline, and he came out of his coma, and he said that you did it, Marty. You lied to him. Yes, I lied to him. Yes. Yeah, and that's all right to do? The United States Supreme Court says it is. And what are you thinking? That this can't be happening, that this is not real. Marty begged to take a polygraph. The detectives refused. So you're better at telling whether someone's lying? I, I think I'm better than a polygraph machine. McCready's scheme worked. Marty began to wonder if he blacked out and, in fact, had attacked his parents. Finally, he told the police what they wanted to hear. It's like having an 18-wheeler driving on your chest, and you believing that the only way you can get that weight to get off your chest is to tell the police whatever they want to hear. Even admitting to a murder? Yeah. Even admitting to a murder. McCready began to prepare a written statement. Are these his words? Did he write this? No, no, it's my handwriting. Although Marty never signed it and almost immediately recanted, the detectives had enough. Marty was arrested and charged with murder. It was wrong. It was wrong from the beginning. Private Detective Jay Salpeter began working on Marty's case seven years ago. You can't leave a case like this. You become addicted to a case like this. Sal Peter's addiction would eventually lead to startling new clues that would turn the case around. Is there a side of you afraid that you just may never get out of here? No. Marty, look! Marty! Look, look. The truth is out there. Think about your parents? Every day. 
Um, I think about all the good times that we had together. From the moment Marty Tankliff was arrested, his cousin and guardian, Ron Falvey, never believed Marty murdered his parents. He is guilty of waking up in the morning alive. And Ron's not the only family member in Marty's corner. I'm Marty's uncle. Carolyn Falvey, Marty's cousin. Ever since the 1988 murders, all of these relatives have been fighting to free Marty. The strange part is there isn't anybody sitting here that ever got a question asked by the police. They never talked to anybody in this room. They no. say you never even tried to talk no, to them. That's not true. Are you that's saying they're lying? True. Yes. Lead detective James McCready. Did you ask to speak with them and they said no? No. I never directly asked them to speak to them. I didn't have to. What were they going to add to my case? But they say they had plenty to add. For one thing, they knew Marty. Does anyone here, though, think it was odd that he wasn't very emotional? No. 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 That was, that's his way. This is the way he is. You got the whole family is here today. And while police say Marty killed his parents to get money, his family disagrees. He didn't get any money. He, he wasn't supposed get to get any money until he was 25, 25. years old. And so what was he supposed to do 17. from 17 to 25? Wouldn't you wait? Were you aware of that? No, I was not. No, I was not. Jimmy, isn't it important to talk to everybody before you settle on someone when you know their entire life no. could be ruined by this? No. Under the circumstances in this case, everything we needed to know, we pretty much knew in the first day. With the suspect behind bars, Detective McCready thought he had the whole case wrapped up in a day. But a week later, with Marty's father Seymour lingering in a coma, the case took an unexpected turn. Seymour's business partner, the same man Marty had told the police to investigate, suddenly disappeared. Did you think he would become then a main suspect? Yes. But as this police report shows, Detective McCready still refused to consider Jerry Stewerman a suspect. I'm reading from a missing persons report and it says, Homicide has no reason to believe that Stuerman's absence is connected with the murder. Why not? Because it, he had nothing to do with that murder. Didn't his disappearance make your case harder? Not that it made it harder. It just, it just added more questions. Two weeks later, the detectives found Stuerman in Long Beach, California. He was living under an alias. I mean, didn't you say to Jerry, you're, you're messing up my case here? Something like that. I remember saying something to him uh, to that effect, yes. Stewerman returned home, claiming his personal and financial problems caused him to flee. I had too many pro problems, and it's just 20 years of building up, that's all. So I staged my death. Is it possible Jerry hired someone? No, nope, he couldn't. He, that man couldn't hurt a fly. One month after the tank lifts were attacked, Seymour died without ever regaining consciousness. Marty was then charged with two murders, and a year and a half later, he went on trial. I think every emotion ran through me, scared, um, fearful, um, but I was also hopeful because I knew that I was innocent. And you know, I always believed that innocent men don't get found guilty. By far, the most damaging evidence against Marty was his confession. But there was little physical evidence to back it up. None of Marty's hair nor blood was found on his parents. His mother, Arlene, had clearly fought her attacker, yet Marty had no cuts or bruises. Only some swelling in his eyes from a nose job he got for his 17th birthday. The jurors also heard from Jerry Stewerman, who denied having anything to do with the crime. I would never do anything like that. He did admit he owed Seymour Tankliff hundreds of thousands of dollars, and part of all of his future ventures as well. You didn't have a right to set up that business and leave him out, correct? In his mind. Under intense questioning. Marty Tankleff sitting over there. Stuerman snapped. The only mistake Your is Honor, can we have a I lived on to allow this. I was a poor man living like a millionaire. By contrast, Marty Tankleff was composed on the stand. Marty, did you kill your father? Absolutely not. 
perhaps too composed, as he tried to explain why he would confess to something he didn't do. They were saying, my father said I did this. My father never lied to me. After a week's deliberation, the jury reached its verdict. Guilty. The day he was convicted was as hard was the worst as the day I learned my sister was killed. Marty was sentenced to 50 years to life. 11 years later, J. Sal Peter, a retired New York City police detective, stepped in. How could you not be involved in a case like this? And this kid didn't do it. Sal Peter believes Marty's alleged confession was coerced, and he is not alone. Oh, it's a confession. It's a false confession. Richard Offshe, an expert in interrogation tactics, is working on Marty's appeals. You know that everyone listening to this is saying, you couldn't make me confess to a crime I didn't commit, certainly not a brutal murder like this. Want to bet? Happens all the time. In Marty's case, he says, the teenager was tricked into doubting his own memory. He knows he didn't do it, but he's confronted with a police officer who's lying to him and skillfully lying. All of a sudden, there's a way of reconciling it. And that is, you had a blackout because of some psychological condition that you've got that impairs your memory. False confessions do happen. 25% of the people who've been exonerated with DNA evidence had confessed to crimes they did not do. Offshe is convinced Marty's confession is false because it doesn't match the crime scene evidence. For example, Marty allegedly told police that he used a barbell and kitchen knife as murder weapons, but not a trace of blood was found on them, even when they were microscopically examined. If he cleaned off the weapons, why wasn't any blood found in the plumbing? Every confession does not have 100% of the truth in it because they don't give you the whole truth. The forensics team found bloody glove prints at the scene, but Marty never mentioned wearing gloves, and those gloves were never found. What happened to the gloves? I don't know. And that doesn't concern you? No. You know, you give me a kid like that, I'll have him tap dancing that he killed his parents. We could do it. Is it right? No. So Peter conducted his own investigation and with old fashioned legwork, tracked down this man, a man who would unravel the entire case. Did you ever tell anybody? No. Former detective James McCready refused to reconsider his initial conclusions, even when the crime scene evidence raised doubts. Once you have that confession, aren't you kind of in a, aren't you caught? Because you can't bring anyone else to trial once you have that confession. Well, I'm not taking a confession from an innocent man. I would never do that. But at the time of Marty's arrest, McCready and his fellow detectives in Suffolk County, New York, had an astonishingly high confession rate. 94%, so high, a state commission said it provoked skepticism. McCready defends his work. A homicide squad is sort of the uh, creme de la creme, if you will. But in Marty's case, says private investigator Jay Salpeter, McCready was simply wrong. The forensic work does not fit the story. If Marty didn't kill his parents, then who do you believe did? I know. Sal Peter says it was this man, Glenn Harris, who gave him the break in the case. A career criminal serving time for burglary, Harris said after 14 years of silence, he was ready to admit his involvement in the Tankliff murders. I thought if I could do something right for somebody else, I'd be helping myself. Harris says that on a night in September 1988, he was the driver on the way to what he thought 
would be a home burglary. Who were you with that evening? Joseph Creedon and Peter Kent. Joseph Creedon, known on the street as Joey Guns, and Peter Kent also have long criminal records. In a notarized affidavit, Harris says he drove them to an upscale neighborhood and parked his car where Creedon told me to stop. When they returned to the car, were you aware of what happened? I knew something happened. Their demeanor, their behavior, it wasn't normal. And what were your feelings? Do you remember that how you something feeling? more than a burglary happened? Usually when you commit a burglary, there's proceeds of something, and that wasn't there. And can you tell me what their demeanor was? Uh, extremely nervous, winded. Uh, Creedence, anxiousness to get out of there. Harris says he later watched Peter Kent burning his clothes, and when he heard about the Tankleff murders, he put two and two together, but kept quiet. I had no right being up there. I was just out on parole. Glenn Harris took and passed a polygraph arranged by Marty's investigator, J. Salpeter. He's telling the truth. In my opinion, Glenn Harris is the hero here. What's more, Salpeter says, Joey Guns Creedon is linked to the man who police dismissed as a possible suspect. Jerry Stuman has ties to Joseph Creedon. This is not a random hit. Jerry Stewerman, the bagel shop owner who was heavily in debt to Seymour Tankliff, is connected to Creedon through his son, Todd Stewerman, like Creedon, a convicted criminal. Sal Peter believes Jerry Stewerman hired Creedon the night the Tankliffs were killed. My scenario is that Seymour is sitting at the desk, Jerry Stewerman is talking to him, keeping Seymour's attention on Jerry. At this point, behind Seymour, coming through the door, Joe Creedon, Peter Kent, and they took Seymour out. And then they went for Mrs. Tankloff. Jerry Stewerman now lives in an upscale community in Boca Raton, Florida. He refuses to talk to 48 Hours, but both he and his son Todd deny they had anything to do with the Tankloff murders. Still, the new evidence provided by Glenn Harris is a major break for Marty Tankliff. He's been granted a hearing. If the judge at this hearing determines that the new evidence would have caused the old jury to vote a different way, then Marty will get a new trial and a real shot at winning his freedom. As the hearing begins, Marty's lawyers, who are working pro bono and his large extended family, are thrilled to be back in court. We are very hopeful. We, we believe in his innocence, and we know that he'll be, hopefully, we know. out soon. But that evidence will not go unchallenged. This is not a game of stickball where you do a do-over. Assistant District Attorney Leonard Lado is fighting to uphold Marty's verdict. There's a verdict, there are appeals, there have been federal habeas petitions. He's lost. Lado says Glenn Harris is a liar. He came forward initially, but when I tried to interview him, he said, I don't want to talk. In fact, when Harris takes the stand, he refuses to testify, afraid he'll be charged with the murders. And in my view, he ha isn't testifying because he doesn't want to get up on the stand and be exposed as a liar. But when he was in prison, Harris confessed to a Catholic priest. With Harris's permission, the priest the tells the court the same story Harris told 48 Hours. He really wanted to do the right thing, but he was a man who was terrified. And there are more than a dozen other new witnesses who back Harris's story. Carlin Kovacs met Creedon at a party, and she says he bragged about the murders. You really believe when he said he was involved in the tank of murders that he was telling the truth? Oh, yeah, definitely. You're being accused of murder. Do you have anything to say? Prosecutor Leto claims Creedon took credit for the crime only to enhance his violent reputation. But other witnesses brought to court by Tankliff's attorneys say Joey Guns Creedon tried to involve them in the murder plot. There's Joe Graydon, 
who says he and Creed made a failed attempt to ambush a man he now believes was Seymour Tankliff. We had to go up to the bagel store to make it look like a robbery. He wasn't there. We missed him. We were supposed to catch him coming out of the back. And there is this witness, Bill Ram, another associate of Creedon. He confirms Glenn Harris's story that the killers started out at his house the night of the murders. What were you doing that evening? I was hanging out at my house, um, had a few people over. Ram, a convicted drug dealer, recalls what Creedon told him that night. He said, I I'm working for somebody um, who's got a partner in the bagel business that needs to be straightened out. He said, you know, there's some money in it for me if we go there and just, you know, he's going to threaten the guy or rough him up. Ram says that he turned Creedon down, but Glenn Harris did not. When I saw him the next day, he was completely distraught. What do you mean by distraught? Just shooken up, couldn't hold the thought, just scared to death. I told him, just listen, keep your mouth shut. What surprised you the most that you've heard from these witnesses? Their honesty, um, that, you know, after all these years, that they would come forward and admit their involvement in such brutal crimes. When it's the state's turn to present witnesses, the hearing becomes almost surreal. Incredibly, the star witness is Peter Kent, Joe Creedon's alleged accomplice. When they bring me in, you know, they told me that we don't, we don't believe that you did this. You know, I thought maybe like they were trying to play technology games with me, you know? <laughs> yeah, Peter, we don't think that you really did it, but just come on, come forward, you know? Kent denies he had anything to do with the murders. I know I was not there with Glenn doing no murders. But even he says Joe Creedon is capable of murder. With a name like Joey Guns? Just not these murders. Joey was not the killer for these murders. I know that because he was not with me that night and we didn't do this with Glenn. It never happened. Were you in that house that night? Creedon, who's been convicted of rape and grand larceny, denies ever killing anyone. But on the stand, he admits to a life of violence, collecting money for drug dealers. It's hard to, to know that a person as evil as himself um, can walk out of the courtroom free, and they're putting handcuffs on my nephew to take him back to the holding cell. Do you believe these two career criminals who have admitted a, a history of violence, right. do you believe when they say they had nothing to do with the Tankliff murders? I believe in terms of the evidence that there's no evidence connecting them to the crime at all, no credible evidence. But the hearing is not over. After watching a 48 hours report on the Tankliff case, a surprise witness comes forward, Joe Creedon's own son. The final witness for Marty Tankliff, and maybe the most surprising one, is 17-year-old Joe Garasio who comes to court to accuse his own father, Joey Guns Creedon, of murder. You didn't see your dad a lot when you were growing up. No, ma'am. In 2004, the young man finally got to spend time with a father he barely knew. He says at first he was thrilled, but later after seeing a 48 hours report on the Tankliff murders, he had to ask his father the tough question. Dad, you know, tell me, did you really do this? He tells me, yes, I did do it. For several months, young Joe says he kept to himself what his father said. When he finally told his mother, she convinced him to testify and called private detective J. Sal Peter. But assistant DA Leonard Lato believes Joe Garasio is just lashing out at his father. The first question is, did the judge believe it? If he doesn't believe it, it's nothing. In fact, Lato doesn't believe that any of Tankliff's new witnesses can be trusted, especially since so many of them have criminal histories. The point is, those things affect their credibility. Like the people who implicated Creedon, they all admitted one thing. Uh, they all hated him. That's a reason to say things about a person that isn't true. The district attorney of Suffolk County has an obligation to seek the truth. The district attorney 
is doing everything here to suppress the truth from coming out. You really believe that? All my heart. In March 2006, 18 months after the hearing began, finally a decision. But it's a heartbreaking one for Marty Tankliff. The judge dismisses the new witnesses as nefarious scoundrels and refuses to grant him a new trial. Which means Marty's conviction stands. But he does have one last hope, an appellate court. I will now proceed to call the calendar. People versus Tancliffe. In October 2007, four appellate court judges hear the case in a courtroom packed with Tancliffe supporters. The DA concedes everything you say. Front and center is one of Marty's biggest and best known backers. James Gandolfini. How did that happen? Well, I met James uh, about two years ago. All right. And I started talking to him about Marty. Actor James Gandolfini went to visit Marty in an upstate prison. He knew I was innocent, he believed in me, and he would do anything he can to help out. Seats come to order. Marty's lawyers argue that even though some witnesses have criminal records, they could still be telling the truth. Prosecutors have to use these witnesses all the time. It's got to be the same for the defense. There were people that you brought forward who have criminal histories, a lot of them. What gave them credibility as a group? They didn't know each other. They came from different walks of life, different communities. So how do you get 20 people to lie, to come in and just make up a story that's consistent with each one and all name the same people? This court stands in recess. In December, the court rules. 19 years after Seymour and Arlene Tankliffe were killed, 17 years after Marty Tankliff went to prison, he finally gets the news he has dreamed of all those years. The court overturns Marty's conviction unanimously. And what did they tell you at that moment? Can I say it? Bruce said, pack your shit, you're coming home. <laughs> that was his exact line. Within days, Marty is brought to Suffolk County one more time. Was there any side of you, Marty, a little scared of getting out? You had spent your entire adult life no. in prison. I was ready for everything. Hey, George, All right, we got our picture. Hi, Marty, look, Marty. Marty, Marty, look, Marty, look, there you go. The following morning, his family gathers at the courthouse. How are you? Congratulations. Marty could be retried for murder, but the court agrees to release him on a million dollar bond. As executed by uh, Carol and Mr. Falvey. Did you have any hesitation to do that? No, not at all. None whatsoever. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Minutes later, Marty walks free. He's out. There's a live picture from Chopper 12. The event is carried live on Long Island television. Marty, how's it feel to be out? We'll make a statement upstairs. Little room, please. Little room. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I was outside, free man, walking with my attorneys and being bombarded by everybody. Gentlemen, we need a pet here. Clear pet, sir. Marty Tankler is coming back in now to go before the microphones to talk to the media, along with his family and friends. Marty! Just mind-boggling. And I walked in there. I don't remember what I said, really. I remember just seeing all the family crying, and I just remember hugging everybody. I wouldn't have wanted it any better way, having all my family together. Welcome home, Marty. It's great to see all of you here today. My arrest and conviction was a nightmare. This is a dream come true. Still a little hard to believe? Yeah, I mean, I, to, you know, it just came so suddenly. We lost the battle, but today we won 
the war. This is a man who gave me my life back. It was his dedication that saved me. We were scared to death 19 years ago, but he's done a terrific job. Did you ever really think this day would come? There's a side of me that finds it hard to believe. However, there was never a doubt in my mind that this day would come. Here comes Marty, here he comes. But at that moment, mm -hmm. you're still facing trial. At that moment, yes, but I wasn't even thinking about it because it was the first time I was essentially a free person wearing street clothing. Marty, right here, right here. Yeah, yeah, right. Marty is followed to his cousin's home. How are you feeling, buddy? How are you doing? Where there is a long anticipated celebration. I, I haven't had a real plate of food, so. <laughs> I walked into my family's house that was filled with friends and family, and it was a loving, caring, warm environment. It felt like I hadn't left. How's the food? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking for another round. <laughs> but Marty Tanklove's case has caught the attention of top state officials, and his fate is now in the hands of the governor. Thank you very much, thank you. What are your thoughts tonight? Uh, I just want to spend some quality time with my family. After 17 years of isolation, Marty Tankliff suddenly is thrust into the spotlight. Marty! Marty, right here, right here! Marty! Thank you, buddy. Thank you, pal. He's moved in with his cousin, Ron Falby. At times, it gets a little hairy, and. You, know, you wake up in the morning and they're sitting there waiting for you. you. You go to bed at night and they're still out there sitting there waiting for you. And yeah, it's like uh, we, we got a little feeling of what a rock star is. You know? It's not just the notoriety that's new for Marty. Shock was the technology. You know, sending an, uh, you know, an email across the world and getting a response back in three seconds. Yeah. Never knew that was possible. The world changed while Marty was locked up. What else? Anything else that surprised you? How good it was to wake up in the morning, be able to make my own cup of coffee, walk out the back door, watch the sunrise. When was the lowest period in all of this? Every day in prison is a low period. You wake up and the smells, the sounds, the noise, that's the low period. And you have to force yourself to get past that period to kind of get through the day. That's the first sunrise that I was able to take a picture of. At age 36, Marty finally feels like a free man. I was given my life back. I mean, literally in a 10-day period, I went from a prison cell, serving 50 years to life, to being back with my family. It's all right. Kind of exciting. <laughs> and Mickey, you want coffee? His apparent seamless transition to the outside world surprises his family. My wife and I have been watching him closely, and, and his manners are still there. He, he still helps his aunts. What else do you need? Oh, thank you. Yes, a little sugar? A little milk? Yeah. What was your concern? Uh, that he would harden in there, and that he would lose his spirit, and it didn't happen. I didn't live in the prison system. I resided there. What do you mean? Well, my body was physically there. My mind wasn't. My soul wasn't. But his legal ordeal is not over. New York's governor appoints a special prosecutor from the attorney general's office to investigate and determine once and for all whether Marty should be retried for the murder of his parents. We can collect materials and try to reach a determination of how long it will take us to be able to decide whether to proceed with the case. It's yet one more frustrating delay. But Marty wastes no time and enrolls in college. At the same time, he helps his lawyers prepare for a possible new trial. And this is all the case files. I mean, essentially, everyone is a different witness. False confessions, coercive interrogations. Come on. Six months after Marty Tankloff's release, the decision. Marty returns to court. But today is a day it's not just about me. 
It's about my mother's sisters, my father's family. He is prepared for battle. 17 years in prison, I fought for the day for a new trial. All rise. The Supreme Court of Suffolk County, criminal term part five is now in session. Though so there is some evidence that Mr. Tangle committed the crimes charged, the evidence is insufficient to conclude or to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he did so. The people hereby move to dismiss indictments number it's 1535. It's over. The Attorney General's office asked the court to drop all charges. Now, the 18-wheeler has finally driven off my chest. I can kind of just get on with life now. While the decision doesn't completely exonerate him, it's the next best thing. Marty is free and clear. His record now clean. They say there is some evidence against Marty. We've known that for 20 years. They browbeat a confession out of him. Of course, there's some evidence against him. Do you feel anybody still looks at you and wonders? Um, I haven't sensed that at all. Um, I think anybody who knows the facts has no doubt that I, they know I'm innocent. What's more, the special prosecutor's investigation uncovers a stunning piece of evidence that points away from Marty's guilt and was overlooked for two decades. There's a bloody imprint of a knife on Arlene Tankliff's bed sheet, and it matches no knife in the Tankliff home. It's showing that someone left the house with the murder weapon, and it wasn't Marty. Marty remains convinced that it was his father's former business partner and hired thugs who killed his parents. My family and I won't stop till, you know, they are prosecuted and they're in prison. But the state says neither that bloody knife imprint nor any other forensic evidence links them to the murders. And the state also finds many of the witnesses unreliable. So for now, no one is charged with a crime. It's frustrating. It, it's frustrating that the system doesn't work. But Marty is finally free to make something of his future. He has set his sights high. I'm majoring in sociology, and then I'll go on to law school. Definitely. Definitely. Why? I've been exposed to a system that just has so many problems, and I want to change it. I want to make changes.